Okay, so what you're seeing there is um, the opening page of the El Crocus monograph um, on Julia Bollas Wilson and, and myself and our, our own El Crocus monograph. And being typical architects, uh, we used a picture of ourselves in, in Venice to introduce ourselves. You can see it some time ago. I still got hair on my head. And if you've been to Venice, you, you will realize that we are riding in a taxi boat. And taxi boats in Venice are one of the most fantastic spatial experiences. They're really, really big motorboats, speedboats, with this cool Italian guy up front driving. If you take one from the airport to, to Venice itself, it costs 100 euros. I mean, they're really expensive, but it, it's absolutely worth it. It's the best spent 100 euros to race across the lagoon in this sort of throbbing modern machine. We are there actually leaving Venice and nostalgically going part or going down the Canale Grande. And in the background of me is the cemetery island, I, um, San Michele, which I, um, where Chipperfield has, has built a, an extension. So let's go on. Um, I think if we were in Venice, I would recommend you have this book in your hand. And, and the verse that, that Chino um, flew over, I, I think, is, is so complex. It's impossible as, as visitors to, to, to actually take it in. Um, if you're academically minded, the, the blue guide is, is really good. At any building you're standing in front of, you can look up, and it has a really complete but somewhat academically dull description. I've got a few photos now from the, the blue guide, and I really like these totally unsexy black and white photos. It's the Piazza San Marco. It was only paved in the early 1700s as well, which is quite interesting, and it, it, it used to be just bare earth. Um, but San Marco's is obviously, when we talk about Piazza, and, and that's the Piazza where it's the sort of base measure for Piazzas. Um, painted by Canaletto, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it, it, it's the biggest cliche ever. And to sit there in a cafe drinking a coffee is, is very expensive. And, and, and one is the ultimate tourist doing that. But on the other hand, there is a sort of depth there, which I think is, is, is worth researching and discussing. On the upper side, there's um, somewhere around here is Harry's Bar, full of Americans. Don't go there. Here, here's a garden, and, there, and one finds little gardens all over the place in Venice, which, which are usually inaccessible. The offices of the Biennale are in this building. Here's the um, Doge's Palace, Palazzo Doniana. Um, somewhere here in the roof, um, what was I going to say there? No, I forget that. Let's go on. This is a drawing of, or painting of mine of, of Venice, and we've, we've taught in a number of workshops. This is actually not painted on the spot. It's a painting from a photograph of, of high water, the Piazza flooded, which is quite an extraordinary moment because it means there are no people there. Well, they build little wooden bridges, like trestle tables for the tourists to walk along. So one gets lines of Chinese sort of tottering along, worried about falling off into the water. But anyway, this is, and there we were teaching a workshop at the um, university, the IUAB. And this is a view from our apartment. And the high water is, and it's basically everywhere, extraordinary moment when the whole city, which you used to be able to walk, suddenly becomes flooded. And I took this photo because I really like this little scene, this little moment in the life of Venice. These two guys met and, and started chatting. The guy in the shorts, we, we watched him from our hotel room for a while. We, we couldn't leave the hotel. The, the hotel offer you plastic boots, which you can tie up around your legs and then go out wading. The guy in the shorts was out, and, and, he, and he was obviously a dog owner. And he had a plastic bag full of dog droppings, and he, he, he was trying to, to secretly throw them in the canal, but he, he met his neighbor and couldn't do it, so he's hiding them behind his back. I, 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 I like this idea, how dog owners deal with high water in Venice. This is somebody else coming home, looks like a student wearing rubber boots. And somebody else leaning out their door. And the doors all have metal panels to make the houses waterproof. Um, oh, that's a gondola. I, I hope nobody does a gondola scheme. I mean, the gondola is such a cliche. It's 
it's sort of almost unspeakably sort of kitsch. In the background is a is it a vaporetta? No, it's a bigger tourist boat. Anyway, um, weather the weather is something which architecture is of, of architecture is very much part of weather. This is looking across the lagoon towards the Lido as a huge black, really sinister cloud moved over Venice. Um, I mean, Venice sits in the middle of the lagoon. The Lido is a sandbank between the lagoon and the Adriatic Sea. And one sees it as a line of lights on the horizon. On the other side of the lagoon is the industrial zone, Mestrin. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. We did a workshop about the um, how, how Mestre could be urbanized. Um, I'm sure you all know the phenomena of tourist ships in Venice. This is a really clumsy collage of mine of Canaletto painting with a shocking tourist ship arriving. There are enormous protests in Venice now to, um, for this not to be allowed, but it actually does happen. This is what it looks like when one of these ships sails through Venice. Um, this is the Canale Grande as it ar arrives at, um, just in, in front of the um, St. Mark's Basin. On the right-hand side is um, Alla Salute. The building with the gold ball on the front is the customs house or was the customs house. Um, I think what one's talking about here is that an enormous scale contrast happened now because of the, our current use, because of tourism. And because most of the buildings are no longer used by their original owners, these are aristocratic families, most of them are museums. Um, the salt store below the, is it a salt store? I'm not sure. Below the customs house at Alice Saluta is, is now a museum. And what Chino was, or Chino very incredibly sensitively interpreted in, in contemporary architecture is, is what one finds on every corner of every street in Venice. The paving is important, this sort of mixture of larger stones and smaller terracotta bricks. Every wall is a beautiful composition of, um, sort of cracked plaster and different windows from different times, different additions. One often sees windows bricked up and then another window put into them. Um, if, you, if you did a screenshot of that, I, I would ask you to redraw it and to maybe find abstract compositions in it. So now's your chance. I'll leave it on for a second if you want to do a screenshot. Um, okay. The skyline of Venice is also really important because the buildings are so close together, people have a, sort of a, a, a private space on the roof and they're, they're sort of caged in with these metal cages and that would also be a possible subject for a project to design cages on roofs. And the chimneys of Venice are all, also a very particular typology, this cone on top of a cylinder. One sees here a metal cage, very elegant, very simple on a rooftop, and then further down a, a wooden roof platform. Chino's building, as you see, it's sort of from the morphological scale, very similar to, to the historic buildings. Uh, and this building was, as Chino said, it was an enormous media hit. And he somehow just cottoned onto the DNA of Venice and was able to put it through an, an, an abstract filter because of, I think because of his mixture of being Italian and his training in America. But I think for social housing, it's a building of incredibly high quality. Um, it obviously refers to a palazzo facade. The Canale Grande is, is, is lined with facades like this. And they are each very carefully composed with the water level, which are, is basically service rooms, and a piano nobile where you see the, the balcony. And the opening, opening talk we had today by Al Alice, the coordinator in, Ven in Venice, she walked up through, through the Palazzo there based in and through the, the central room, which has these big windows looking out to the canal. This idea of, of these oculus of the Palazzo being this, being this central room. At that point, there are le rooms left and right of the central salon. And then at the, the upper level, I guess, more, more private rooms, bedrooms. 
Um, because you don't have cows, you have boats moored right in front of your house and you can, you can go in at the ground, at the water level. Extraordinary thing is that when these buildings are being, are being restored and they suddenly take on an incredibly abstract form and they, and they, they're encased in, an, in, in a new wooden architecture. And I'm, I'm really fond of these big forms which suddenly appear in the middle of the historic city. I would be very happy if, if, if somebody in, in our studio took this as their base model and then um, pirated this image and worked on it and, and dropped it on, on other, other locations in Venice so with or without a historic building behind. Really, really important is here on the bottom right, these columns standing in the water. This is a structure built new with temporary columns in the water because the building behind has its own foundations. I think this, this little support is really indicative there. These, these white panels also, and these sort of barbershop poles, which one finds everywhere all over Venice, it's a postcard image. Another Palazzo facade where the main salon is off center. I've no idea what these are called, but if somebody wants to work on facades like this, I've got a really fat book of, um, with beautiful measured drawings of hundreds of facades like this. I could scan them in if, if you ask me. Um, th this is the central salon, what it looks like from the inside, with the big windows to the Canale Grande. This one is now used for exhibitions. Um, what's the painter's name? Sean. An Irish painter, super hip at the moment. This is just a, a view to, to show you um, what it's like inside with big wooden beams spanning this wider, larger room. Sean Scully. This is from the blue guy showing a staircase inside. Um, I forget which palazzo it is, but you know, I, I like very much this fuzzy picture. And it's a an extraordinary staircase balustrade. I'd be really happy if somebody took this as, as the Im image for their project. And balustrades are normally, you know, in a functional sense, they have to have a minimal opening so to people or kids or dogs don't fall through them. But this one looks, it looks more like a beehive. And with, with, with a staircase balustrade, how you turn the corner is always the really important point. And here's, done with, with a slight jump on the upper, the upper balustrade. It's a good solution. Another palazzo. This might, it might be the no, it's not the Cadoro. The Cadoro it means the golden palace. It's similar, you see the, the big front door opening onto water and the main salon on the first floor. And the proportions of the windows are important as well, that the lower floors are much smaller windows because they're not so useful as, as living spaces. And then the big representative public and Piano Nobile here. And then also main, there's probably a, a second main room here. Another palazzo with a rusticated base. Yeah, Sorry, what, was, was that a comment? Does any, if anyone wants to comment or ask questions, please butt in. I like the speedboat in front of the front door. Between the palazzi, palazzi one has really narrow passages um, leading down to the bright light of the water. They're incredibly dark and shady in, in really hot Venice summer. They're, they're really welcome places to, to hang around and wander down. We see lots of new surfaces added to the outside of the facade. Um, I think not only Venice is, is available for our workshop. Also, if one takes a, a Vaporetta, the, the, the bus boat, and one, one can go, one can cruise around the lagoon. They do a loop, so you're always sure of getting back to where you started. This, I think, is the island of. Torcello. I don't know what the building is. It looks like it should belong to an airport, but I don't think it does. It's probably some sort of maritime building. There's going to be a talk um, as part of the whole this whole workshop exercise 
by somebody who discovered a design by John Hader for one of these islands in the lagoon. I recommend you watch that. Um, also, Torcello, the, the, the smaller islands have so smaller villages, and Campanile, like, like this one, which doesn't stand in a piazza, but stands in the middle of a wine field, an axial relationship to a building at the end. And, and, and these are incredible spaces to, to, if one just takes a day and gets off randomly on little islands. Um, workshops in Venice. This was from the first one I taught in 1998, Venice Barcelona workshop. It was actually it was actually a sort of scam workshop set up by a couple of guys who were teaching in America, and they called themselves the Institute for Advanced Architectural Studies. They basically made up the name and then advertised for students to come to Venice or Barcelona for a workshop. And then they employed us or um, Louisa Hutton and Matthias Saarbuck to, to teach their workshops. So that, and even the workshop in Venice is a sort of cliche. And there are hundreds of schools and universities who have residencies there. I still wear this t-shirt on weekends when no one sees me. This was the, well, it's a, my sketch summary of, of that first workshop. Um, I tore a piece of poster off, off a wall in Venice, which showed the lagoon and the, um, the uh, rain blockage. The Lido. The Lido is this sort of sandbank between the lagoon and the Adriatic Sea. Our student projects were to be on the Lido. They're sketched in plan at the top corner, then in, in elevation as they would be seen across the water. And it's, it's just a piece of evidence. It's, it's not important to the project, or to our project. And, and this is teaching a later workshop. We were teaching at the university, the IUAB, the university, whatever, whatever. Um, the project then was to do with Magera, the industrial zone on the mainland side of the lagoon. We didn't want to, or for our studio, we didn't want to tackle the large scale of industry, which is in complete contrast to the romanticism of Venice. We instead, we studied the map and, dis and discovered there was one artificial island um, called, which we named Mud Island. There was nothing on it. It was full of highly polluted mud, which had been dredged out of the canal or maybe industrial pollutants. We're not sure which. We set our students the program to design housing for 2000 students. We called the program 2000 Students in Toxic Mud. Um, as teachers, having set this program, you aren't allowed to visit the island, but we actually we persuaded a friend who's a professor at the university to take us in his little wooden boat to take us across the lagoon to, to Mud Island. Here we are leaving Venice. We're leaving from the, the Canareggio region. And every corner of Venice is sort of laid laden with stories and mythologies. Canareggio was the site for a series of um, theoretical projects from an exhibition, I think it was 1980. And the most, most well-known is one from John Haydock, The 13 Towers for the Canareggio. I think they come later in my talk, or one from Peter Eisman. This is also the location of Le Corbusier's design for the hospital in Venice, which was not built. So here we are leaving Venice, uh, this is the this is the, the the first drawing I got from the archive. A really bad quality um, scan of John Haydock's scheme for thirteen towers for the Canareggio. One of the most enigmatic and poetic projects of, of architecture in the last fifty years. And I don't know if you know it. Does anyone know it? No. Um, it's very dangerous to look it up on the internet because there's really bad pictures of it and bad copies by bad American students. And this is, and I think, a travesty that such a profound scheme should be, should be so misrepresented. Anyway, so that's the plan of uh, Haydick's scheme was these 13 towers, little buildings, very high. I think they were meant to be for the oldest residents of the neighborhood. And very, very beautiful, very poetic little drawings. For the same neighborhood, Peter Eisenman 
did a scheme which was, very, as Eisenman always, gridded and regular. This grid, grid of cut out squares, which were then filled by red cubes. The red cubes were then abused, twisted, cut, folded, whatever Eisenman wanted to do to them. It was often said that Bernard Chumi copied this scheme for his La Villette scheme in Paris. And, and Venice is, is the sort of source of lots of ideas for, which, which um, circulate around architecture. For the same exhibition, 1980, Raymond Abrams, really important Austrian and radical architect, is here designing a hospital on the site of the, the, the unbuilt Le Corbusier Hospital. I think he called it a place for dying. And Raymond Abrams did very beautiful drawings, architectural drawings. If anybody wanted to, to screen this and then research Raymond Abrams, it would be a very good exercise. Um, I think Chino mentioned the I, I Carlo Scarpa courtyard in the Giardini, where the, where the Biennale happens. This is the courtyard in the Giardini. I, I want to say a little bit about the Biennale, the architecture Biennale. And one can't say too much about it because it would be overwhelming. It would, it, it's, it's like an encyclopedia. And every couple of years, thousands of interesting architectural projects are exhibited. Um, it's often just too much, and one's totally exhausted and can't take it in. Then one has this little courtyard by Carlos Scarpa to retreat to. And Carlos Scarpa was from Venice, and there's lots of Scarpa buildings in Venice, which I would recommend looking closely at as a basis of a project to, to pirate them. Um, next. This is a, a random picture of a Biennale exhibition. I think it was the... Swiss pavilion, very nice space, very Swiss, very reduced, obviously about urban space, but there's obviously something wrong with the scale. The person in the buildings and the chairs just don't fit together. Scale jumps a possible theme for piracy. This is another absolutely random snap, snapshot from a Biennale a couple of years ago. These are typologies by the Berlin architect Hans Kohlhoff, a very rational, rigorous architect who used to work for O.M. Ungers. I think these are studies for his Potsdamer Platz Tower in Berlin. Anyway, it, it, it's a random choice. I, I, I don't see much link between that and Venice. This is another Biennale exhibition by Valerio Oggiati. Olgiati, the, the naughty boy of architecture. Um, the, the, the Biennale or the architecture part happens in, the, the, in a, an ex-rope factory. The rope factory is a really long space where they used to weave ropes for the Venetian ships. It has a central axis like a church, a sort of nave, and left and right really monumental round brick columns. Um, Olgiati... Algiati contradicting the high ceilings or introduced a low ceiling, putting his big wooden box or hanging his big wooden box in the middle of the space. And his intention, I assume, was to make an intimate space where people could cluster around the table he put in the middle. The table was illuminated from the ceiling and on the table he'd asked 30 or so architects to to send him um, images which which were relevant or which were important to their work they were arranged alphabetically so i i think a very interesting concept for an exhibition not to show your own work but to actually show show contemporaries and this picture actually the, the little pictures on the right i'm on my own reference images the ones in the center are from venturi in Scott Brown, and he was organized alphabetically. So I found myself next to Venturi, Wilson Venturi. Anyway, that's, and it, it's, and the Biennale is, is a huge architectural hype, dialogue between architects. It's often much more interesting the Biennale to walk out from the exhibition buildings and look at the, at the docks behind. And I think to just closely study or take apart the components of this picture would be a really interesting exercise. The brick tower, little customs building, evaporata, cranes for lifting boats out of the water, etc. 
I think this is one of the few parts of Venice which, which still still seems to function or, or function as Venice used to function. The Arsenale is really important because it's where the Venetians historically built their ships. And the wealth of Venice is based on their, on their trading. Um, and they were well, basically Venice became rich during the Crusades because the, the sort of Christian loonies who were coming from, from Central Europe and wanted to get to the Holy Land had, had to get across the sea. And the Venetians were the only ones who could take them. So the Venetians did a deal with them saying that if they captured Constantinople and gave it to the Venetians, they would take them to the Holy Land. And they did, and so the Venetians extended their empire as far as Constantinople. Good piece of trading. Um, the, 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 the Venetians were importing stuff from the east, so spices and silks from, from India and further, which came across, across the overland route, the, the route Marco Polo um, opened up. Marco Polo was a Venetian. Yeah, actually, one, one starts telling stories and one story leads into the, into the next. And I think I referenced somewhere in the text I gave you, um, Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino. Does anyone know the book? Good. That's really good because um, um, Calvino, the way he used Venice as the model for all the invisible cities he described is basically a, a good analogy. I think for Chino Zucchi, and he couldn't mention that because being Italian is probably the biggest cliche ever. Anyway, so Asanale. Um, also in Venice, um, on the Lido is um, the, the Palazzo del Kino, Kinema, the, the, for the site of the Venice Film Festival, Festival. This is Will Smith arriving at the Venice Film Festival. You, you can't see Will Smith, of course. And we, we were there for the Biennale that year, and at the same time there was a competition for a new cinema palace on the Lido which we took part in and were un unsuccessful. This is, or the ring is the site of the, the um, Venice Film Festival Cinema Palace. In, you see it in relation to the, to the island of Venice in the background. And you also see the opening of the lagoon to the Adriatic Sea. There's been a dam built here now to, to, to contain the high water. It cost million and took and took to tens of years to build, and apparently it it, it, it doesn't one hundred percent function. But anyway, this is yeah, the, this is the Lido here. One coming from St Mark's there, one takes the Vaporetta across to the Lido here. Anyway, this was our design for the Palazzo del Cinema. This is down here is the Hotel Excelsior. Long, long history, very famous. Um, have any of you looked at my book, Some Reasons for Traveling to Italy? There's a chapter in that about the Hotel Excelsior, about um, people who stayed there, um, Cole Porter and Diaglia staying there in the 1920s. Um, also a piece of history. And, uh, and the Lido is a beach with bathing boxes, this, these famous bathing boxes drawn by Aldo Rossi. This is the existing Palazzo del Quirma, this building as well. And this, and this is the new building we're proposing. One can come by taxi boat or Vaporetto here from, from the lagoon side. Here's a star-shaped pool for stars to be photographed. This was our scheme. And I was very unhappy with it, actually, with bathing boxes in front. It's an Elevated platform, so piazza in the air. This is the existing Palazzo del Cinema, with then bars and restaurants on top, and then a flying canopy roof. The point of the canopy roof was that it was illuminated from underneath and was to be seen across the lagoon from Venice. This is the canopy roof of the Venice Film Festival, reflecting on the waters of the lagoon. This is the this sort of illumination of the leader, which we saw in the big dark cloud picture at the start. There used to be a sign somewhere here at the Lido, a huge neon sign saying Cinzano, which was really iconic. And they, they took it away a few years ago. Cinzano would be a theme for piracy. Um, I think that's, we're getting to the end now. I, I want to talk about 
our project and from from this talk i i thought to follow this and some, some other images with the ones we we managed to pirate from the archive at the school but in terms of a site and as i described it in the text i gave well, I think the, the reference project for this workshop is actually the Aldo Rossi Teatro del Mondo, the, the floating theater, which he, which he put in the center of the, the lagoon in, in front of St. Mark's in, what year was it, 1979, 1980, the first ever architecture biennale. Well, as a matter of history, I, 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 I must say that the first ever architecture biennale was in 1980. Before that, there was only the art biennales. And in 1980, I think I was the youngest participant invited to take part and at the age of 30, much too young to be in a forum like this. Um, this, this is San Giorgio Maggiore from Palladio. Oh, no, actually, I'm not wishing really this, more the follows this. San Giorgio Maggiore, fantastic elevation seen across the water, the monastery here. In this building is the refectory, the, the dining room. Ah, this, this is from the blue guide, folded out. Um, so Marco is here, Alice Salute here, St. Giorgio Maggiore here. This is the Judeca. The Judeca is the island which used to be occupied by the Jews of Venice before the Venetians got worried about them and, and locked them in the ghetto. Um, if we were to site our projects, and the site is this front face of the, the Judeca, the project by Chino is somewhere over here, or maybe that site. But I, I want to say a little bit about San Giorgio Maggiore here. And at some point, some 10 or 15 years ago, we were asked to design a little pavilion, a capanna. Capanna is a, a bathing box. Um, the little bathing box is on the leader by Aldo Rossi, our cabana. You can, uh, in my book about reasons for traveling to Italy, I have a price list. And you, you can, if you go to Venice for the summer, you can rent one for a horrendous sum, something like 5,000 euros. You can get a cabana in the first row, which means, which means that you're visible to everybody who walks up and down the beach promenading. Um, we were asked to do a little temporary pavilion, which was only there for a couple of days in the refectory of Palladio's um, San Giorgio Maggiore. This is our capanna here. Um, it was meant to be a capanna for Palladio, Palladio's bathing box. There were a number of sponsors whose materials we had to use. One was a um, linoleum tile company who claimed that they could do intarsia with linoleum. So this was, this, this was the P for Palladio here and the P's inside the pavilion. One was a company who do really expensive plaster work, Stucco Lusto. This, is, this box is in Stucco Lusto. And uh, I forget who the other one was, but this, this pavilion is made up of boxes. Uh, each piece is an individual box because it had to be transported across the lagoon to, to, to arrive here. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a maximum size of, of things one can transport. So that's Palladio's Capanna um, in the refectory of, well, there it is again with, Palladio's little changing room, Palladio's beach ball. And there it is, collaged onto the beach of the Lido. And the bathing boxes here look like this, they really rather ugly um, plastic boxes, look more like portable toilets than bathing boxes. And here's Palladio's Capanna, much more noble. I'm talking boxes, and there are these very curious red boxes appear all over Venice regularly for building restoration work. I think this would be a really good subject for piracy. This one, I think, is like a parasite attached to um, St. Mark's Cathedral, the, the facade of St. Mark's, you see standing on scaffolding. This building language of wooden, wooden slats and scaffolding support. It, it's, it's basically a language used all over the place in Venice for temporary buildings. The theater of Aldo Rossi was, it was built on a, on a, a big, a big pontoon, a, a raft. It was built in, in, internally, it was, it was a labyrinth of scaffolding and then the wooden facade was, was attached to the outside of that. The same construction technique as this box. And see here, there's a 
stones of Venice, as Chino mentioned from John Ruskin, so different marbles, red stones, and dark stone for the, what are they called? Um, spouts. Smaller box for restoration. The public kept away. I think it's here clamped onto the building it's restoring. And again, different stones. I think this relationship between the permanence of stone, which which of age with, um, in a dignified manner over hundreds of years, sometimes not. This, no, that's I thought it was stains, but it's a two-dimensional pilaster. And these these things which come and go, very important. Yeah, Aldo Rossi now. Um, Aldo Rossi's Teatro del Mondo, Theatre of the World. This is a Rossi drawing with him collaging completely wrong scales. His theater, the Alice Saluted Church, and another octagonal tower by Rossi, and a, a wall, it's a brick wall, it's a really solid, the wallness of a wall drawn by Rossi. This is Rossi's theater arriving for the 1980 Biennale, and, and this, this building stole the show. Everybody photographed this rather than the architectural Biennale. You see here, it's, it's floating on the water on pontoons. You see the scale of person here, wooden box and very rossy blue. It's meant to be the blue of the Adriatic Sea. This is the dome of Alice Salutia. It's almost arrived at its site. This is the, um, what's it called? Dusadoro is, 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 this, is this, this sort of island where, where Alice Salute is. This is a photograph from, from the, um, I think this one's is it from the archive, no, maybe not. Contemporary photograph, at least of, 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 the, of the parking place of, of Rossi's theater. It's obviously a sort of comment on the, the customs house tower with its gold ball. Rossi has a gold ball on top. Yeah, this is the industrial barge. It was made, it was actually constructed in Mestre, the, in, the industrial site on the, on the land side of the lagoon. Oops. Um, inside it was an octagonal theater, I think a form of Renaissance theater. And it, it, it's never shown for the space inside, although there were performances done there. Simply the, and the, the fact that a big new object appeared in, in this, this really very, very, very special urban location was, was the magic of the event. Does um does Rossi's does that Rossi theatre seem very thin and flimsy to you with in comparison to the kind of buildings that surround it? it to me, it looks rather lightweight and it that's, is that's part it's of a temporary effect, building. Right? And there's and there's two different ways you can look at it. And one can talk about literal mass or solidity or phenomenological mass, a building which which feels through its composition as if it's massive. And I think Rossi is obviously using using it like a theater set. And it's, it's like the um, Palladio's um, te Teatro Olimpico, the, the whole stage set, which has urban streets, which are only, only knocked up in wood. Uh, a, a little narrative here. Um, I was at, the, at that Biennale and, and saw it there. One didn't realize what an iconic um, object it would become. But a few months later, I took my students back to Venice, hoping to show it to them, but it was gone. Very strange thing in architecture, which is there for, for a moment and then gone. So this is me with um, maybe lecturing my students. I, I, I think I was, you know, we were actually, we were looking for the, for the Rossi Theatre. This is on the cemetery mm -hmm. island, climbing a ladder. The ladders they used to service the high rise graves or the stacked up graves. So sort of looking over the walls, looking for Rossi's theatre. We couldn't see it, but we asked around and somebody said, oh, it, it's, it's back in Magera. It's, it's somewhere nearby to the Villa Malcontenta from Palladio. So we went to the Villa Mal Malcontenta, that's it, by Palladio. Also a whole other exercise. There's a very important book in architecture called Architecture and Transparency by Colin Rowe, again, Colin Rowe and Slutsky about the proportions of the Malcontenta being taken or being being the same as by Le Corbusier in his, which villa was it? Villa, villa, I've forgotten which one. The, the malcontent is a, is a 
very important building. Um, so near the male container, we tend to actually, this is not my photo, this is, this is fake. I think this is the Rossi Theater during construction or maybe on, on, on its way to Venice. Um, I think one sees an airplane flying over it there as well. I like these black and white contemporary photos, 1970s. This is what we found when we saw across the reeds and, and, the, and the mud banks on, on the edge of the lagoon, this sort of familiar silhouette. We, we, we walked up to one of my students, an American student, immediately went up to a window, ripped off the window surrounded with blue painted piece of wood as a souvenir. So we, we told her off and said, this is architecture, not a souvenir shop. And that piece of wood is probably a really valuable trophy now. Anyway, this is how we, how we found the theater after it had been in, in the lagoon. Afterwards, it was, and the story is, it was sailed across the Adriatic to, to where? To Croatia. To Croatia, where it was taken apart. I have no idea what happened to it. If there are myths like this in architecture. There's the story of Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion, which was also a temporary building. I once saw a lecture by Rainer Banham, who we saw in the bubble with Chino's lecture. And Rainer Banham said that the architect or the, the, the Mies Pavilion, was, when, it was, when the exhibition was over, it was taken apart, put in boxes, and the boxes lost. And then Rainer Banham said, but still in architecture schools all over the world, it's whispered between students, Barcelona lives, and it, it will one day be found. I, mean, I had never heard that whispered in the corridors of the AA, but anyway, but, and Barcelona does live because it was reconstructed some 15 years ago by Professor Sula Morales, so a very, very precise reconstruction with lots of very good academic research. Anyway, these are myths of architecture, buildings which appear and disappear. We ourselves once built a, a folly for an exhibition in Osaka, which was packed in boxes. It was meant to go to, go to the city who, uh, who, who, who was sponsoring it. I don't think it, it ever arrived. So I'm, I'm really hoping one day it will be discovered and reconstructed. Mythologies of architecture. This is the Rossi building passing the chimneys of Magera, the, the industrial zone. Probably also passing the Mud Island, where we where we did our project for two thousand students in toxic mud. These are obviously very bad scans from from old slides of not contemporary media. Ah, yes, and another story. Um, this is another page from the Blue Guide about the academia. The Academia is, um, it's, uh, there's the, the Academia Bridge and then the Academia Gallery. The Academia Gallery has incredible artworks, including this one by Giorgione. It's called The Tempest. But there is no convincing art history explanation for the painting. There's a sort of soldier figure here, here a lady here with, with a baby, suckling child. In the background, there's a huge storm and various ruins. Um, this is a very bad, bad picture. Okay, that's it. That's the, that, that's, that's the actual Giorgione picture. And we stood in, um, we had been at another Biennale and were totally mind smashed by the Biennale and went here for a respite. We stood in front of this picture and we were brain frazzled again. What, what could it possibly mean? Um, we read a bit of its history, and it, it was it was for a private patron, and he obviously lived with this picture on his wall, and maybe developed his own perception of it. So, with that in mind, we discovered at that time that there is an internet site where you can order any classical painting you like to be copied by trained artists who will who will paint it and, and send it to you. And this sounded too good to be true. So we, and we immediately got onto them and ordered a copy of the Giorgione painting. I told Julia, my wife, and if it's a good one, I would like the same painting for every birthday for the rest of my life. Um, 
So the, the Giorgiani painting came, it turned out to be painted in China, not America, as, uh, as the advertisement said, and really badly painted as well. I, I was really upset when it came. It came in a, in a, in a drawing roll. So when it came, I unrolled it. Oh, no, at the same time, it is just to mix stories together. After having seen the Giorgiani painting, we went around the corner and there was an Elder Rossi exhibition with um, a, a model of, of the theater. And one wandered past the model and further into the exhibition. And somewhere up in the back of the exhibition was this really curious and enigmatic exhibit. It was Elder Rossi's personal wooden Pinocchio. And he was a life-size boy made from wood. And, and his conical hat was like a Rossi shape, et cetera. It was an, another enigma. It was also an enigma because there was a second doll, a second uh, sort of mother figure leaning over it. It was like a Pieta, the sort of Christ and, and, Christ and, and, and Maria, sort of dead Christ and Maria um, composition. But as we all know, Pinocchio did not have a mother. Pinocchio was a, was a child. So Pinocchio became another little obsession of pirating something from Aldo Rossi. This is a painting I did of Aldo Rossi's Pinocchio. So done from the photograph of, the, of Aldo Rossi's Pinocchio in the exhibition. Um, please don't, don't, don't pirate this one. I, it would be very painful for me to have to discuss it for two weeks. Anyway, Pinocchio became a sort of motive. And when, when my Tempest painting arrived, so it's, supposedly copied perfectly. It wasn't, I, I had to repaint, put paint in leaves here and to add balconies to these buildings. So basically I pirated, pirated the copy, the pirate, pirated copy of, of the Tempest. In, in my painting, I lifted off some stones, made them, made them sort of anti-gravity stones. And as you see in the background, I inserted a bit of Aldo Rossi and analog, analog Analog City, a theater and a cone. And the soldier himself became Pinocchio, who offered like an art, histo art historical um, analytical tool, Pinocchio's nose providing a vector. And art historians always, always look, at, look at people's eyes and, and who are they looking at? That's, that gives a symbolic relationship. So here, if you follow Pinocchio's nose, you reach the lady, and then you the lady looks down to Pinocchio's feet and that bounces up here and follows the same geometric trajectory around and arrives at Algarossi's theatre. So here's using, using Algarossi's Pinocchio to, to provide a narrative for the, for the painting. When it looks closely at the baby, he's now become a little baby Pinocchio as well. I mean, I, I, I'm showing you these just to show that Venice provides all sorts of clues for constructing personal narratives. I mean, I, I, I don't intend these to be um, material for our workshop. Anyway, my loony Pinocchio stuff. This is my sketchbook sketching facades in, in, in Venice, umbrellas of a cafe, maybe on the Judeca where, where maybe our projects could land. So this, this is two studies of Venice, where our first workshop there. It was really hot and the coolest place was to lie on the, the marble floor of that department we rented. And these were the marble, were the mixed marble samples of, of the floor of the apartment, next to a panorama of the Canale Grande, it's a tiny minuscule scale here, super close up zoom. I think it says, PW ninety eight. Yeah, that was the year it was done. This is. Oh, I, I want to show also my project for the Academia Bridge. This is the Academia Gallery, a converted church, Canale Grande here, gondola. The Academia Bridge. There have been a number of different bridges. Venice was occupied by the Austrians for I don't know how long, fifty years maybe. Napoleon, when he invaded Italy did a deal with the Austrians. If they gave, or if, if Napoleon gave the Austrians Venice, the, the Austrians wouldn't, wouldn't give Napoleon problems in Italy. So the Austrians in Venice, then there was a bridge needed here. They built a steel bridge here, which is really unpopular. And it was, it was 
taken down, I think, when the Austrians finally left left Venice. I, this, is, this is comparing my proposal for the, for the Academia Bridge with the Austrian bridge there. Anyway, um, I think the reason why Scott asked me to teach this program is because of my Academia Bridge design, which is now, I think, 20, 25 years old, but it was published in the AA Files magazine and seems to have been, become a reference for lots of people. This is the Academia scene from the balcony of one of the palazzo, Palazzi the Academia facade, and the existing bridge, which starts here, you can't really see it in this picture. It's a temporary wooden bridge, which has always been a temporary wooden bridge. It's now somewhat unstable. And for one of the Biennales, Aldo Rossi as curator, set the theme to design a new bridge for the, for the, for the Academia to replace this temporary wooden bridge, which replaced the Austrian bridge. So I took part in that competition with this scheme. Oh, we finally get there. Um, this is the bridge, the academia in the background. Also a new Vaporetta station for the, for the water buses. This is a very rough sort of Gothic collage. The situation is that the bridge starts from this side where there's a very deep cut into the fabric of the city and a garden here with big cypress trees. So it's, it, it's unsymmetrical. It has this side it has a long ramp coming slowly down to the pavement level and on the other side it ends abruptly with this new facade there's some references to facades like that in a minute and then there's a big staircase here so space of performances that's the plan the academia here the long ramp here and then the bridge the, the bridge actually cantilevers. It, it, its structural system is one-sided. It's like a finger reaching from this side and almost, but not, not exactly touching this side. It's supported in the middle by this extra truss, which has cables, which, which holds up the center. Um, a very weird and complicated structural system. There you see it in elevation. This is the truss. There are wires here you can't see tied back down there and holding up the middle. And this is the finger of the, of the beam underneath the bridge. This is the ramp, which has shops to one side, like the Rialto Bridge, and the really dark Italian trees, which we made in steel wool. And this is the model I made with two of my students. We actually made it without a workshop. We made it with hand saws on the, on the office table. Um, on this side, there's a screen wall, like a triumphal arch. But there's the Rialto Bridge. You can see on the side here that, that there are shops across the Rialto. And there's a, a, a salon on top. We called it a Biennale Chamber, supported by a beam, which looks like a gondola. Bad idea. The gondola is supported by a giant figure. Also a bad idea. Anyway, this is the structural system, the pre-stressed beams underneath, and cantilevered steel arms, and then wooden panels between, and very, very heavy handrails. And these are very rough drawings. It was a time where one was trying to do really quick collage-like drawings. That's a very bad photo of the model. The model was exhibited recently in London at Betts Project, which is a gallery for architecture. Um, the, it's the Mako side with the long ramp and shops, steel wall trees, canopy roof. Can I ask a question while we're on this, Peter? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think you mentioned maybe in the brief that, you know, um, this project kind of differs from the modernist conception of, a, of kind of structural rationality and the bridge being uh, yeah, ra like rationalist and uh, almost homogenous in its, in its layout. And, but I think, you know, there's something about this design that, that also appears structural, you know, with the, with the tensile members and the, and the crane and things. And I was wondering what you see as the difference between those two approaches. I think the modernist approach would try to solve everything with one single architectural gesture or one form. And we'll, we'll see later on, I've got a few schemes by Italian architects. And it, it would be sort of one-liner 
And I think this scheme is cumulative. There's, also, there's a whole layering of ideas, of multiple, multiple ideas. There's the bridge and then there's the steel structure, which it, it, it's, I think, Chino was talking about grafting and it's basically grafted. It's sort of ideas put one on top of the other. Um, yeah, this is the academia side, the giant figure holding up the structural gondola. And basically it, 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 it is really Gothic, but then Venice is Gothic as well. It's sort of, it's not rational like Renaissance architectures based on grids and squares, etc. You see here the bridge arriving, but not structurally connected. It's got a little, what do you call them? Um, not sure that there's a word for where, where, where bridges stand. And then there's, there's also a staircase inside this wall, which leads up to a gallery, which the public can stand under this protective roof. The skin is in copper. This is a very expressive drawing of the inside of this upper room, an art salon, normal street life happening below. This giant figure holding the structural gondola. And, the, and the, this, is, this is from the mid 1980s, a time when one, or when architecture went a little bit, little bit wild in its modes of presentation. But the reason for, the, for this um, archway gateway and their historic precedents. This is a picture of the academia or a historic picture with a building in front. Then the academia, is, there's a campanile there and a bigger building in front. And the campanile is now gone. This is a temporary archway, a triumphal arch built in front of the Doge's palace for the arrival. I think it was an, an English king. I'm, I'm not sure who it was arriving, but they, they built this for him to come from his boat and to arrive formally in Venice. So my screen was meant to be to follow this historic precedent of, of, of these pieces. Um, but and the Academia Bridge, it, it's such a, an important site in Venice. I, I, I think Scott, when he first asked me to teach this program, asked, asked if, if we could do the Academia Bridge, but I said, no, it's, it's not a good idea. It's a real hot potato. And the Italians wouldn't touch it because it's, it's, it's such an important site. So that's the model we made. Um, I'm, to be absolutely honest, Calvin Rossi did not select this, this scheme for the, for the Biennale either. So and basically we were the outsiders, the, the Salon de Refusé. Um, well, we were back to the- do you, know, do you know why Rossi chose not to select it? Uh, I'm, 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 there was a very, a very extreme division at the time between between the rational, rational architecture and <clears throat> or basically the, and the, the, the school I belong to, the, the AA, which were much more experimental. So basically we were, we were the outsiders trying to get a foot into Venice. Um, this is a, from the blue guide again, the Judeca Canal and the Rossi scheme land, landed, where, where are we? It landed just here. No, um, yeah, it landed here, that's right. This is the uh, San Giorgio Maggiore. The Judeca is this waterfront, which one sees as a really long, um, elongated elevation from, from the other side. This doesn't quite make sense to me, this picture. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Um, San Giorgio Maggiore again. Th there's a sequence of individual pictures here, which I, which I imagined was, was like a site for us. I, if if we take if we develop objects from our pirated whatever, and I imagine those being on barges like the, the Rossi Theatre, and those barges could be anchored along the along the, the Judeca. That's the total picture. Um, so Giorgio Maggiore is off here to the left. This is Il Red Redentore, another Palladio building. Once a year, there's a or Chino's. Housing is somewhere over here. This is the long elevation of the, the Judeca. Once a year, there's a temporary bridge built here from um, your Redentore across the Judeca Canal. It, it's built on pontoons, on boats, and people walk across for a religious festival, and they walk across the water, which they can't, cannot normally do. And these are the close-ups. 
Um, I, I think, and we will give you give you these digitally if you want to collage your your schemes into them. But, and the, the, the taxonomy of, of, of these little buildings is quite extraordinary. And the way Palladio put this big theatrical facade in the middle, and the way the little little houses sit next to it. Um, the Judeca is also not very deep. It's maybe only 50 or 70 meters deep. And then there's the lagoon on the other side. So maybe you, you would want to do an intervention here, which cut right through the, from here to the other side and to create a window to the outside from Venice. And here, and I think some of these buildings are student hostels and a little cafe here. And then very nice little color, flashes of color, red rooftop pavilion. I think these are where old warehouses, I'm not sure, but then yeah, here's people walking in front and the scale is quite extraordinary. You walk here, you've got the whole of Venice as your, as your view, as your stage set when you're there. There's the canal to cut through here. And maybe, you know, we actually don't see Chino's building on the right there, but it's somewhere there on the right. I think that's my last image for this talk. I, mean, I would like to have a drink of water and then show you some other the, the, the pirated images from the archive. So uh, I guess we'll jump uh, right into the lecture. Uh, I'm uh, Daniel Tudor Montanu. I'm an architect from uh, Romania, and uh, together with uh, Davide Tommaso Ferrando, an uh, architect and uh, scholar from Torino, Italy, we started this uh, project, this exhibition project, the Unfolding Pavilion. The first edition of the Unfolding Pavilion happened in 2016 in the preview days of the Venice Architecture Biennale. And uh, it all uh, started with uh, me approaching uh, Davide uh, and just uh, asking him, but would you be uh, interested in uh, 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 starting uh, and, uh, and creating uh, an, uh, a collateral exhibition for the, for the Venice Biennale, an independent exhibition? Uh, we have uh, collaborated uh, before, uh, but we didn't uh, knew uh, each other in person. In fact, uh, the first time we, we've met in person was on the Torino airport uh, just uh, two days uh, before the uh, opening of the exhibition. And uh, we had some uh, ideas about the content that we want uh, to show, about the subjects that we want to investigate. But uh, we uh, knew right from the beginning that uh, the space of the exhibition is of the utmost importance. And uh, we started uh, to scout around uh, Venezia uh, online. Uh, I lived in uh, Romania. Davide was living in uh, Torino at, at the time. Uh, so uh, we scouted around uh, different uh, available resources for, for uh, an exhibition space that would inspire us. And we were very lucky to find uh, this one to, while looking on Airbnb, for example, uh, in order to, to perhaps rent a space we were amazed uh, to find an empty unit uh, available uh, to be uh, rented inside this uh, phenomenal building, the Casa Alezzatere, uh, one of the most uh, famous buildings uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, Venezia and uh, probably the only uh, major building of architectural significance that was uh, actually built in Venice along the major canals. Because, as you know, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, couldn't build uh, the Massieri Foundation, Le Corbusier didn't build his hospital, Louis Kahn didn't build uh, his uh, auditorium, but uh, Ignazio Cardella managed to build this, uh, this project. And uh, once we found uh, this project, we immediately booked it. Uh, we didn't have any institutional support. 
So each of us uh, put, uh, put uh, uh, half of the budget uh, from our own funds and we booked uh, this uh, space. And then we started to research it. And just like we always do, we take uh, quite an in-depth uh, research, uh, scanning all the publications, uh, finding archival uh, materials, and so on and so forth. And uh, we managed to, to uncover some uh, uh, never before seen uh, materials and uh, parts of the story of the buildings that were not presented uh, into the uh, uh, Gardella monographs, for example. Uh, this is uh, the site of the building as uh, it was presented in uh, an engraving uh, from uh, 1730. Uh, the uh, building, uh, the site of the building uh, stood next uh, to uh, the Chiesa del Spirito Santo in the Tzatere area uh, along the Judeca Canal. And uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, nondescript building that you can see on the left of the church uh, was bought uh, by a very uh, powerful and rich uh, Venetian family who wanted uh, to build a real uh, estate uh, investment in that uh, place. So they approached uh, Gardella and uh, commissioned him to do a project. This uh, is actually a collage uh, that uh, Gardella did uh, while he was uh, surveying the, the site in 1954. The patron uh, of, uh, of the building, the commissioner, was uh, this countess, uh, the Countess Anna Maria Ciconia Volpi di Misurata. Uh, Anna Maria Ciconia, uh, a very powerful and uh, influential uh, Venetian person, was uh, the daughter of uh, Count uh, Giuseppe Volpi di Misurata, one of the richest men in Italy. Uh, a businessman, but also a politician. Uh, he was the governor of Tripolitania and uh, he, he was the ex-minister of uh, finance of Italy and uh, the person who actually started the Venice Film Festival. So Anna Maria, Countess Anna Maria Ciconia approached uh, Gardella and uh, this is the first version of the project that Gardella uh, did. Uh, and uh, this uh, project, uh, despite the very powerful and influential client, was not approved by the Venetian planning authorities. And uh, as such, Gardella had to adapt. And uh, the project uh, undertook uh, several years of uh, alterations and modifications, and it was done uh, and redone several times. And this is the final version that got to be built. And um, it is uh, a sort of, it was uh, even called a sort of a proto postmodernist building. It was finished in 1958, uh, and uh, Gardella managed uh, to uh, employ uh, a lot of elements uh, uh, from, uh, from the architecture of uh, Venetian uh, Palazzi, uh, but still he managed to uh, do a building that uh, hides uh, his, uh, its mass and its uh, height, uh, you don't notice it at first, but it's the highest building uh, along the Judeca Canal. So it appears that uh, Countess's uh, Ciconia real estate investment uh, proved uh, to be very successful with uh, more apartments to rent or to sell. Uh, Gardella uh, looked uh, very closely to the architecture of the Venetian Palazzi. He was not Venetian, he was a Milanese architect, and he drew inspiration uh, from, uh, from the buildings uh, nearby. Uh, this is uh, the Palazzo Volpi di Misurata along the Grand Canal, the residence of the uh, patron of Countess Anna Maria Ciconia. And uh, Gardella looked very closely on this Venetian Palazzi, also on the famous Cadoro, 
and uh, managed uh, to employ a lot of elements uh, uh, in, in the architecture of the Casa Lezzatere. Casa Lezzatere, who was actually called by the uh, famous uh, Italian critic Giulio Carlo Arcan, the Cadoro of modern architecture. Of course, uh, it is a very good uh, building, uh, I would say, but uh, it proved also to be controversial. Uh, and uh, it stirred a lot of debate uh, in the uh, Italian architectural circles, but also uh, uh, it engaged a lot of criticism also from, from abroad. Uh, Bruno Zevi and Rainer Baham uh, didn't, didn't exactly approve of the Gardella's contextual approach but uh, still uh, recognized uh, the mastery of, of the architect in uh, designing this uh, building. Now, what's uh, very important to say is that this building being a luxury condominium with uh, luxury apartments was uh, never uh, open to the public. So uh, all the critics, uh, uh, all uh, the architects, uh, all the people in the past 50 years just saw the building from the, from the outside and drew conclusions from the way the building appeared in, in, in the city and inserted uh, itself uh, into the fabric of Venezia. And uh, since uh, we were the lucky uh, renters uh, of this uh, apartment inside the building, uh, we managed to, to open up the building for the first time for the general public. And you see uh, the interphone of the building with the unfolding pavilion listed along the names of the uh, very uh, rich uh, and, and powerful uh, neighbors of ours. And uh, for the first time, we published uh, images of the interior of the building, of the inner court, of the inner facades, and also the inner spaces. Uh, the only time the, the interior of the building was photographed uh, was in 1959, when Giorgio Casali took this uh, photo shoot for uh, the publication of the building in Casabella magazine. And this is the uh, image of the apartment uh, that we leased. Uh, it was a small uh, apartment uh, with only uh, two rooms, cramped uh, somehow between more uh, luxurious uh, uh, living uh, units. It was not facing the Grand Canal, uh, the, uh, Canal de la Judeca, it was uh, facing uh, a rear uh, street. And uh, this is how it looked like. It uh, looked uh, quite uh, hideous. And uh, we uh, started to, to investigate the possibilities of how we can uh, clean this space and put its uh, architecture and the space uh, in, in preeminence. And uh, this is how the exhibition space looked when we opened the exhibition. So we removed uh, the furniture and the appliances and uh, the furniture that uh, we couldn't uh, hide away. We just uh, dressed into white uh, fabric. Now, the subject of the exhibition uh, of the first unfolding pavilion was curated archives. It is a term that we used uh, when we are speaking about the independent editorial projects that happen on social media and uh, that uh, they follow very strict uh, editorial protocols and they have a huge audience. Uh, perhaps uh, the combined audience of these uh, small independent projects uh, is bigger than the audience of the established uh, uh, magazines like Domus or, or Casabella. And uh, we thought that it is an interesting and necessary subject uh, to explore and uh, document. And we asked uh, the authors of several uh, such curated archives to uh, step out of their comfort zone and uh, instead of digital publishing to create objects and interventions and installations inside that apartment. But just like uh, Ignacio Cardella did uh, with his building, drawing inspiration and commenting and, uh, and reworking the Venetian context, uh, we asked uh, the authors uh, uh, that we chose uh, for the exhibition 
to do the drew inspiration from the context of the exhibition space itself. And uh, you see here some of the pieces that we exhibited. Uh, this is a chandelier that was done by Davide Trabuco. Davide Trabuco is the author of Conformi. Uh, you can uh, find it uh, on social media, particularly on Instagram. I recommend you. It's a beautiful uh, project uh, in which uh, he uh, says that the forms do not belong to anyone. And as such, he creates these uh, beautiful compositions mashups of uh, high and low brow uh, uh, images uh, from, uh, from high and, and pop culture. And uh, it's exactly the same uh, protocol that he used in creating this object. He employed the negatives of the fretwork of Gardella's balconies and he matched them with an off the shelf uh, cheap uh, IKEA uh, chandelier. Uh, Fabio Alessandro Fusco, uh, who always uh, does uh, these very intricate and uh, detailed uh, hand-drawn uh, maps, uh, recontextualized uh, one of his existing drawings. And by adding and exchanging several panels uh, inside that art piece, uh, he centered uh, the entire uh, artwork on Venetia with Casa Lezzatere in the, in the center. So uh, this existing artwork uh, gained new, new meanings. Uh, Falatelier. Falatelier was at uh, the time uh, a young uh, office uh, from Portugal uh, known for their collages, uh, who proved to be very inspirational for students all around the world. And uh, their little built work uh, was uh, uh, limited to uh, interiors for small uh, Airbnb apartments in Porto. And as the world's uh, most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, notable architects in dealing with Airbnb apartments, we invited them. And uh, Val Atelier created uh, this piece with 107 new designs for the uh, Gardella apartment. Uh, which uh, employed uh, them in the form of a poster, which uh, apparently decorative, it actually contained 107 iterations or, or new possibilities to, to uh, redo the, uh, the, the apartment of the, in which we organized the exhibition. And we left uh, this poster on the wall uh, uh, after uh, the closing of the exhibition as a, as a gift. To, to the owner, if uh, the owner will ever need uh, uh, to redo the, the apartment, he might draw inspiration from uh, Fal Atelier's contribution. Um, Christian Valenzuela Pinto, the author of the Deseopolis uh, blog, uh, created uh, this uh, installation in which he employed memory retention devices Christian knew that uh, he couldn't uh, travel from Chile to Venezia to see the uh, space, to, to, to see the exhibition. And uh, as such, he sent us this uh, maquette. It is uh, an object uh, in which Christian imagined uh, the apartment uh, drawing uh, uh, inspiration from the different sources uh, we put at his uh, disposal. And uh, through that uh, visor, you could uh, look at uh, the exhibition space as it was imagined to be uh, by uh, Christian, overimposed on the actual exhibition uh, space of that uh, apartment. Uh, Luca Galofaro also employed his usual protocols in creating collages and starting from uh, Giorgio Casali's uh, uh, photographs of the Casa Lezzatere, he started to modify them and uh, he created these uh, beautiful uh, layered uh, collages. Beniamino Servino uh, again uh, uh, started to, to draw uh, upon uh, the image of the Casa Lezzatere and just like he always does, he adds uh, uh, different uh, digital layers and then he scans and he intervenes uh, by uh, hand and so on and so forth. 
And in the end, he created uh, this uh, new uh, uh, building uh, to, to replace the Casa Lezzatere as a, uh, uh, as a uh, uh, vacation place for the proletariat. Uh, and everything inside the exhibition had uh, to establish a dialogue with uh, the exhibition space and with the building and with the history of that building. As such, uh, we didn't uh, employ the strategy of the white box. So instead of uh, using a white box, uh, which, uh, which decontextualizes the uh, artworks, we said that uh, we want to put the context uh, uh, in the uh, forefront and uh, declared that the context is content for, for our exhibition. We colonized uh, all the spaces uh, inside that apartment. We installed this uh, shower curtain uh, in, the, in the bathroom by Michael Abrahamson, the author of Fakia Brutalism blog. <clears throat> we even used the, the closet in which we uh, installed these uh, pamphlets that were specially done for us by uh, Andrew Kovacs, uh, the author of uh, the Archive of Affinities. That closet also proved very helpful for us because uh, we hide uh, in that uh, closet the, uh, all the uh, domestic uh, appliances uh, inside that apartment but also for a limited duration of time when the apartment was uh, leased by some other people uh, in between the photo shoot, we put the whole exhibition inside that uh, closet. And uh, as we said uh, at night, uh, the exhibition that happened in this domestic uh, space uh, uh, re uh, uh, started uh, to, to work as a domestic space. So we slept inside that uh, apartment. And you see the curatorial and the exhibition team uh, enjoying the, the life inside the exhibition, which happened inside of a domestic space. A domestic space with all, uh, which also encouraged another way of behavior for uh, the public. Uh, which took a more uh, casual approach, engaged in long conversations, uh, took off their shoes, uh, left uh, their uh, luggages. Uh, basically, they felt at home, a thing which never happens uh, in a regular uh, pavilion or in a regular gallery. And uh, I will close the presentation of the first unfolding pavilion with this image which uh, put side, uh, side to side one uh, photograph that was taken by Rafael Moneo in 1964, when Moneo uh, first uh, came to Italy and he visited the outside of the building and took these uh, uh, photographs uh, uh, for a critique of the building that he wrote uh, for the Architectura uh, magazine in, in Spain. And we put it side by side with uh, the same, uh, uh, with an image taken from the same angle showing the vernissage of our first unfolding pavilion. Uh, after the closing of this uh, exhibition, uh, we continued to unfold uh, the, the uh, different uh, documents and uh, interventions online on the Unfolding Pavilion website, uh, which uh, is like the catalog, like the final uh, repository of information for all the exhibitions that we do. And uh, Encouraged by the success that this uh, exhibition of ours had, uh, we uh, started uh, looking uh, for another place uh, to organize the next unfolding pavilion. So here we are uh, crossing the Judeca Canal. And uh, on the island of uh, Judeca, we found uh, this uh, amazing uh, building uh, designed by Gino Pale uh, in the 1980s. And we immediately fall in love with and decided right on the spot that this is where we will organize the next unfolding pavilion. 
So two years later, 2018, again, in the days of the opening of the Venice Biennale, uh, we uh, worked on this uh, building by Gino Valle, a social housing complex. And uh, as you can see, our logo always uh, 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 draws inspiration from the features of the building. Now, uh, this uh, building is in fact a complex of buildings totalizing 90 apartments. It was built uh, right on the back of Molino Stucchi on the island of Judeca. And uh, since it is a social housing complex, of course, you cannot find any Airbnbs in there. So how do we uh, manage to get inside of that building and again, transform it as a uh, uh, space for an exhibition. And uh, by, uh, by getting in, in touch with the people living there, we uh, find out uh, that uh, of the uh, 90 uh, social housing uh, units uh, that comprised the, the, the entire complex, around 15% of them were empty. And uh, that is uh, because uh, in uh, Italy, uh, there is this uh, rule, this protocol, that after one of the tenants uh, leaves, uh, the company that administers the building has to refurbish uh, the, the unit in order to meet the standards uh, to welcome a, a new tenant. But uh, the company that administers uh, this uh, building, the Isola, company, which is state-owned, didn't have the money to, to refurbish uh, these uh, units. So after uh, one of the tenants uh, left, uh, they simply uh, locked uh, the, the, the apartment and lived it like that. So uh, uh, now that we knew of, uh, of this phenomena happening in, uh, in there, we contacted the uh, uh, company that administers the building and we said that okay we know that, that there are some uh, apartments which are uninhabited and we want uh, for a short duration to organize an exhibition in there and uh, it was a long and painful uh, uh, exchange of, uh, of emails but in the end they uh, uh, came with uh, a solution and they said that okay we have uh, several apartments uh, which are in the state. Uh, we do not have the money to refurbish them, but if you uh, refurbish one of them out of your own funds and with your own workforce, then you can use it uh, for uh, uh, some days uh, to organize your exhibition. So we said that, okay, we will do that. Uh, we, this is the contract uh, that uh, we signed with this uh, company. And uh, this is uh, the state of the apartment uh, that we chose. Uh, uh, it was uh, a beautiful unit, a triplex uh, apartment uh, right in front of the building, but also uh, uh, looking uh, towards the, the archipelago. And uh, we had to, uh, to refurbish this apartment in order to make an exhibition in there. And as such, we managed to secure uh, funding. We are an independent exhibition. We are not attached to any institution, but we apply for different uh, fundings uh, here and there. And with the help of the University of Innsbruck, uh, who financed the second uh, unfolding uh, pavilion, we uh, managed to, to secure uh, a small uh, part of the necessary budget, uh, which was used uh, for buying uh, uh, construction uh, materials. And since we couldn't afford to, to hire any professionals to, to work with this refurbishment, we had to do it uh, by ourselves. And you see here the curators and a lot of uh, students and architects, friends uh, from around Venice uh, working on this uh, uh, re redoing of the interior. But not only the interior, but also the exterior spaces, the green spaces, and uh, since uh, we published it on, uh, on social media, this process, it generated quite a lot of uh, momentum. So uh, uh, the exhibition uh, 
was very much anticipated by, by, by the general public. Uh, and while uh, refurbishing the exhibition, this idea came into uh, our heads that uh, uh, the, the context is, is very different. The context for the current generation of Italian architects uh, is uh, radically different uh, from the context into which all these uh, grandmasters of Italian architecture, Gregotti, Gino Valle, Cartella, Rossi, Aimonino uh, worked. Uh, the young architects in Italy are facing a uh, much, uh, much uh, narrow range of possibilities. And we thought, okay, uh, we have an uh, exhibition uh, space inside of a famous building uh, built in the 80s. What if we concentrate uh, on the exhibition itself, on the generation that was born after 1980? what uh, happens with this uh, generation that uh, we called Little Italy. So we took a survey. Uh, we uh, took a survey, we investigated uh, uh, the current generation of Italian architects and uh, by means of a call for, for projects, we chose several of their projects to be exhibited. Uh, projects that uh, also, like in the first edition, uh, were reacting uh, to the context of the building, uh, to, to the context of the exhibition space itself. We also did a documentary uh, in which uh, we uh, uh, interviewed uh, the neighbors, we interviewed several critics, etc., etc., that we showed uh, in the exhibition. And the exhibition, just like in the first edition, uh, colonized all the interior spaces of the apartment, but not only the interior. Uh, the exhibition started to, 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 to also move from the interior of the apartment itself. Uh, Studio Spazio, for example, did this very beautiful intervention, installing a new window silo. Uh, but uh, there were several other installations dealing with both the interior and the ex exterior uh, spaces, such as this uh, light installation by Warehouse Architecture Research from Rome, which, uh, which uh, uh, followed the path throughout uh, the, the common spaces of the building and then entered the building. And it finished with this uh, disco ball, which made a very uh, beautiful and weird uh, atmosphere at night during the vernissage and uh, another light installation in the common uh, spaces of the complex, this one by Buono Prismontas, uh, a uh, uh, half Italian, half Estonian studio working in, in London, who took uh, the grid, the 165 uh, meters by 165 meters grid that uh, Gino Valle used uh, for, for his building and uh, illuminated it and as such, the, the, the underlying grid of the architecture of the complex uh, became visible for the first time. And you see here shot from above. And uh, in, uh, in other common uh, spaces of uh, that building complex, we also installed artworks. We created uh, a symposium and a series of lectures uh, and movie screenings and so on and so forth. And uh, different from the first uh, exhibition that we, we did, we also went uh, and visited the Gino Valle archive. Since Pietro Valle, the son of Gino Valle, uh, is a friend uh, of ours, uh, we went and uh, saw the Gino Valle uh, archive and uh, um, looked into the available uh, materials and uh, started to uncover some never before seen uh, instances uh, of that uh, project that we also exhibited in, the, uh, in this second unfolding pavilion. Drawings, uh, but not only drawings, uh, even the model that uh, Gino Valle created uh, for the limited competition that was organized in the 80s for the creation of this building. And uh, I would uh, like to uh, lastly show you uh, one final project uh, from this exhibition. 
You see on the left, uh, it is uh, a project done by Campo Marzio, a studio from, uh, from Trento, who uh, overimposed uh, uh, two, two uh, projects, two quite famous projects that were uh, designed for the same site. One of them is, of course, the project by Gino Fale, and the one you see in red is a project by John Hajduk, uh, a project uh, for one of his uh, 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 interventions in, in, in Venice, a paper project called The Cemetery of the Ashes of Thought. And uh, by overimposing these two projects, you notice uh, uh, a weird similarity that both Gino Valle and John Hajduk uh, used the same uh, spaced grid for their intervention here in the back of the Molino Stucchi. Uh, one other image that I, I would like to show you, and you have to keep it in mind, is uh, this one. Uh, so when installing the exhibition, we had uh, these cardboard uh, leftovers. Uh, that we played with uh, and uh, we uh, uh, made this impromptu composition and we make a joke uh, on our Facebook account saying that uh, it is uh, 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 the model of a shortlisted proposal for the Judeca social housing complex done by Enric Miralles and Carme Pinoche. Of course, that's not true. But still, a lot of uh, people believed it to be uh, true. And weirdly enough, it was even photographed uh, and uh, presented into several international magazines as such as a model left in open air of a project by Enric Miralles. Now, after the end of the exhibition, uh, this is uh, how the space uh, looked like. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, gave, uh, gave the apartment uh, away to, to Isola, the uh, company that administers it. And uh, we also gave away a lot of materials that we didn't uh, need anymore to the neighbors. And you see here the neighbors, uh, using some materials for the exhibition in creating these uh, uh, flower pots and uh, some other neighbors enjoying some uh, uh, furniture from our exhibition and so on. And uh, when we come back to the exhibition, we were very curious uh, to meet the new family that because of our intervention in there would inhabit this apartment. But sadly, uh, we found uh, only a new interphone and a plaque uh, saying that uh, this uh, apartment was refurbished with European money funds, which of course, that's not true uh, at all. It was refurbished with the funds secured by us. So sadly, uh, I don't know what is happening now. Perhaps we should go back and check it out. But sadly, one year after the exhibition, uh, no one still was living in that uh, apartment due to the idiocy uh, of Italian bureaucracy. Now, in uh, for 2019, uh, we looked uh, for some other places in Venice where we could uh, 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 investigate uh, the, the, the space for, for the next edition of the Unfolding Pavilion. And at first we looked on this uh, space. Uh, it is a shop, uh, the Friso Silverware Shop in Campo Santoma, that was uh, done by uh, Carlos Scarpa in the 1930s. Uh, and uh, we knew that, uh, that uh, the Scarpa uh, uh, shop front was heavily damaged uh, in the 1960s uh, by a flood, but still we wanted uh, to, to see what is going around in this uh, shop, which was never published. And uh, that uh, shop was uh, being uh, closed uh, for the past decade or so because uh, the new, uh, uh, be because the family that owned the shop uh, was having an inheritance uh, trial uh, and uh, there have been some, some problems in the family, but still we managed to, to enter. 
these are the only images that uh, existed of the SCARPA intervention. Uh, sadly, there was indeed uh, no trace of, uh, of SCARPA intervention anymore. Still, uh, the, and this is the back of the shop, it looked uh, absolutely amazing, a place uh, for, for the Venetian uh, manufacturers uh, to, to do uh, absolutely beautiful uh, silverwares. Uh, this space still retained an, an aura that we, we liked uh, and we considered it for the unfolding pavilion, but uh, still we found this place to be much nicer. Uh, it is uh, again uh, a social housing uh, complex uh, in the Canareggio area near the train station, a project by uh, Vittorio Gregotti, uh, social housing uh, ex uh, SAFA also from the 1980s. And we decided that, okay, for the 2020 edition, we'll work on this one. And we started to research it, dug into the archives, uh, spoke with uh, some of the architects that participated in the design of this complex, uh, managed to secure funding, uh, managed to, to come up uh, with a theme. And uh, just when we were uh, in the middle of uh, uh, arranging this uh, this whole new iteration of the unfolding pavilion. Uh, COVID uh, crisis uh, happened. Uh, Vittoria Gregotti died because uh, he was infected with uh, COVID. And uh, we simply, and the Biennale was postponed. And we said that, uh, okay, we don't want to show uh, at the Biennale a project that was uh, uh, created uh, before the whole uh, pandemic uh, uh, started uh, because uh, we felt that uh, uh, we couldn't ignore as architects at the biggest uh, architectural event this whole global crisis. So we shelved uh, the project and uh, instead we started to work on a new project that I will let Davide present to you. So guys, we are going to uh, abuse for a little more your attention. Daniel has been explaining to you the first two iterations of the unfolding pavilion. And now I'm going to uh, dedicate uh, a little bit of time to the third and last one, which is the one that Daniel was uh, anticipating uh, uh, right now. He explained to you how we started to um, uh, investigate the, uh, the site of the ex safa social housing complex by by Vittorio Gregotti. And as a matter of fact, as we always do, we look into documents, publications, and so on. And one of the things that we um, discovered was this actually quite interesting book. It's titled Dieci Immagini per Venezia. It is the publication of an exhibition which was held in 1980, uh, organized by the UAV University of Venezia. And this exhibition was an exhibition of a workshop which took place in 1978 at UAV with several international architects and several uh, professors from the UAV who were asked to produce visions and proposals for the area of Canareggio, which is the area where the ex safa building by Gregotti uh, was eventually uh, built. Among these projects, some of them are pretty known, but there's one project uh, less known than usual, but to us extremely interesting, and some of you uh, guys are actually working on it as far as we understood. It is the, the project for the 13 watchtowers of Canareggio. If you are already familiar with it, you know that this is a, a complex project made of several architectures which are intertwined by a very interesting and strange fiction. So the main idea uh, of Hajduk, first of all, you can see that the, the Venezia where the project is set is not the actual real Venezia, it's an analog Venezia, it's an imaginary Venezia that, or a memory of Venezia in uh, Hajduk's uh, head, of course. And here in a Campo of Venezia, he would place these 13 watchtowers, which would be nothing less than social housing units, uh, where 13 inhabitants would be placed um, and where they will be basically locked in to live their lives. In front of these 13 watchtowers, there will be a 14th house, a wall house, a typical John Iduk wall house, which will be inhabited by a 14th person who's basically waiting for one of the 13 uh, inhabitants of the other towers to die to take his place. And when that, when that happens, when he takes the place in the tower, then someone else will take his place inside of this 
wall house in front of the towers. Now, this very strange network, this very strange story builds uh, actually another project, which is a project we started to be extremely even more interested in, which is the house for the inhabitant who refused to participate. This is a house for one inhabitant, one citizen of Venezia who refuses to join this macabre ritual of uh, living in a social housing unit and being replaced when you die and so on. So in Hajduk idea, uh, the, the city council would give this one person who doesn't want to take to join this, uh, this ritual, would give one full house, one wall house. As a variation on the wall houses of Hajduk, you can see that there's a typical vertical surface from which 12 rooms are hanging. Uh, each uh, room is like a, a small box of two meters by two or something like that. Quite interestingly, each one of these rooms hanging from the wall uh, is dedicated to only one function in the domestic space, since it's furnished with only one piece of furniture, which allows to perform only one domestic function. So you would have the room with the bath tube, the room with the table and chair, the room with the bath sink, or the room with the shower, and so on. This was a strange critique that John Iduk was doing on the extremes of ration, uh, rationalist uh, architecture we would say. And therefore, this uh, organization of the house would generate this very strange domestic space in which you would move constantly from one room to the other, from one floor to the other, to do your, let's say, to live your everyday life. This house, this with these uh, 12 um, rooms uh, hanging from the wall, is actually posi positioned in a very special place. It's in front of a campo. And in front of the house, there will be a tower, which is another, a 14th tower, actually, which is another uh, super important element of this overall uh, project by Hajduk. This tower is accessible from the public. Uh, the people from who live uh, in the city of Venezia can actually climb into the tower and reach a small room, which is hidden behind a mirror glass, from which it is possible to spy on the life of the person who's locked inside of this uh, house for the inhabitants who refuse to participate. And as a matter of fact, as you can also see from this uh, drawing, I mean, the windows of these uh, boxes are as big as possible. So it, they really allow the interiors uh, of the house or the private space to be completely visible, therefore to be somehow completely public. Now, we, were, we knew this project uh, and it, it, it was something that we read while we were researching in the, on the ex Safa uh, complex. But then when we started to discuss what should we do now that it is impossible and we don't want to absolutely do an exhibition on the, on the ex Safa complex due to uh, the coronavirus uh, crisis and so on, we started to remember of this very strange facade which was drawn by John Iduk, uh, looking at, uh, at its facade with its vertical grid of windows, framing the everyday life of its inhabitant uh, in front of the eye of the public. Uh, the more we looked at that, the more we couldn't avoid thinking about uh, the surreal condition in which we had already started to, to live our everyday life since uh, several months. We as well, like the inhabitant of John Iduk's house, we were locked inside of small rooms. We were often in complete isolation. We are performing strange rituals in front of the public eye of the internet, which we allow, uh, as we do right now, by the way, into our own private space every time we switch on our webcams to join a Zoom conversation. And in that very moment, every time we, zo we join a Zoom conversation, we also are suddenly projected outside of our rooms and into a bi-dimensional space of digital proximity that shows very similar features to the one which is defined by the facade of John Iduk's house, as you can see. And so when we started to realize this very strange relationship, with unexpected relationship between Zoom and the John Iduk's house, we also realized that the house for the inhabitant who refused to participate was the perfect choice for the third edition of the Unfolding Pavilion. Not only because it is, again, a little known, extraordinary project, but especially because working with it would have allowed us to give a new meaning and a new life to this project, extracting it from history and making it a parad paradigmatic example of our by then contemporary conditions. Basically, starting to work with it would have allowed us to also speak of contemporary domestic conditions without directly mentioning COVID, which was something that we found extremely uh, wrong that many curators and architects were doing in that moment. And so we thought, uh, well, Hajduk's house was part of a complex fiction. Uh, why shouldn't we also build a fictional house to host the third unfolding pavilion? Why not imagining that 
a replica of this house, for example, had been built actually somewhere in Venezia. So giving us the opportunity to fictionally enter it and open it to the public as we uh, did in the two previous editions, as Daniel has said. But then of course, the big question arises, how do you enter a building that doesn't exist? So while thinking about these uh, pre preliminary questions, uh, which were going to, this, to the, define the protocol for this third exhibition, we took two immediate decisions, almost immediately. The first was that, that, was that the title of the exhibition was gonna be Rituals of Solitude. And this is a quote that we took from a, a text we were reading those days uh, about the project by Hajduk, a text written by Michael Sorkin, who actually in those very days also unfortunately died of COVID. And the second, uh, so solitude, isolation, solitude would become the main theme, the leading theme of our uh, exhibition. And the second decision we took was that we would use all the media and all the means available to us to communicate that the replica of the house actually existed, that its finding was not fictional, but true. And then to, in order to see then what, what kind of effects this revelation would produce in the public that we always communicate with when we do our own projects. And so the project started. Of course, the first thing you need to do when you want to build up a, an exhibition into a fictional, fictional building, you need to produce a fiction, inevitably. And so we decided that, first of all, the building, uh, the replica of John Iduk's house <coughs> would have been built, or we would have found this replica somewhere in the Venetian lagoon, built on one of these many uh, small islands which are uh, spread around the um, the lagoon itself. There's two main reasons for we did that. We chose this uh, thing of the small island. The first thing is that, of course, islands are archetypical already figures of uh, isolation and solitude, but also because, of course, we didn't want to disclose the exact position of this house, so it would have been much more difficult for the public to go and check if the house was actually there. If we had said, for example, it was in a specific calle in Canareggio, they could have checked it wasn't. But saying it was in some island in the archipelago, well, we, we could have said whatever we, whatever we wanted. But there was also another reason. Uh, uh, as always, we try to also relate to contemporary issues and that of the small uh, islands in the Venetian archipelago is an issue for today because many of them are public and they get privatized uh, without basically consulting the citizenship of uh, of Venezia, of course, uh, even if some of these islands are places where the people go during the weekend, for example, to relax, they get privatized and usually transformed into um, luxury resorts, uh, glampings, and, and so on. So we knew that by uh, speaking of islands, we were also making emerge this theme uh, that was a theme which is dear to the city and, deep, and important for the political, let's say, condition of Venezia nowadays. We, we concentrated after looking into several uh, possible options on this specific uh, island, which became a reference, even if we never mentioned it uh, officially in the project, which is the island of Tessera, which in the days where we were preparing the project was actually being again sold at an auction for a 3 million euros price, uh, a price that we think was never met. Probably the, the island is still to be is still to be bought by, by someone. We thought that this idea of the island, which is almost there to be sold, was perfect as a setting for our project. And also because there were already a couple of projects done for this island, such as uh, this one by a former uh, dean of the UWAV for the transformation of the island into a resort. This is from 2011. And there was also a project from 2016 to transform the island of Tessera in a uh, actual uh, luxury glamping. So that's the, the story, that, that's the setting that we decided to choose. This small island on the way to be transformed into a luxury glamping. There we had to generate a character, of course, a fictional character to somehow build a story around. And this fictional character almost automatically was generated by uh, using as a collage uh, some of the people we could say that we met uh, during the previous editions and also that we were discussing in those days or reading in those days. So there was, of course, on the one hand, on the left, you would see Contes d'Ozonville, portrayed by Ingres in 1845. This is a painting that was very important for John Iduk. He particularly mentions the strange reflection of the mirror behind the Contessa and the strange proportions of the arm, uh, of, of the left arm of the, of the Contessa. So the Contessa d'Ozonville started to generate this idea of the Contessa, which was completed 
by the figure of the Contessa Cicogna, which Daniel already presented to you at the beginning. So the owner of the first unfolding pavilion, basically. We, of course, we had to work with this idea once more of the rich and powerful woman. And then Marina Ripedimeana was actually a quite eccentric figure in the Roman jet set from the 1960s, been married several times to influential, important uh, noblemen and politicians, and very close to the art scene of uh, Rome. Somehow these three figures, uh, historical figures, uh, we made a mesh up of them to generate the character, which would be Countess Luisa Albertina di Tesserata. And we started to build a story around her. The story would go that the Countess, um, who was an art collector, uh, while watching an episode of the Hollywood Squares, uh, suddenly got inspired to uh, ask uh, an architect to build on her private island in the Venetian archipelago, some sort of architecture which was will be inspired by this scenography from this TV show that was very dear to her, where to host her most precious artworks, one per room. Um, several contacts were made with different architects, among whom John Iduk, who provided the Countess with several sketches of an idea of a house that he was starting to have in his mind for this, uh, for this um, for hosting these artworks, but actually nothing really happened with John Iduk. Several, year several years after this contact, um, the Countess decided to have the house built by herself. So she commissioned a local uh, anonymous bricklayer to actually realize this house without John Iduk knowing. So she could finally put her most precious artworks inside of this house, which you now see here in, into a mist of fog that uh, of course strategically quite hides the, 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 the building. Uh, the Countess lived on the island for a while, her artworks were there, but then she died of course. And after her death, uh, the island was abandoned, the house was abandoned and it started to become a ruin. Uh, actually, one thing which is important, before she would die, she would actually bring all her uh, artworks to the island by means of a trabaccolo. This was also part of the story. And a trabaccolo is a typical Venetian um, kind of boat, mercantile boat, which she owned from her family. So he would, she would move from Venezia with the artworks with this very heavily loaded boat to drop the works on her island. And then the boat would go back to, the, um, uh, to, the, to, to Venezia again. Uh, finally, as said, the Countess died, the island was abandoned. It was uh, sold to a company which was uh, aiming at um, transforming it uh, uh, into a luxury glamp uh, glamping, but before the demolition happened, we somehow get to know about this very strange story through some architecture students from UAV who took some pictures uh, of, the, uh, of the island. We check on uh, Google Maps. Yes, there's something there. It really looks like a John Hyduk's house. Therefore, we go to the island. We realize it's there. It's a replica of John Hyduk's house. Therefore, we contact once more the owner of the islands asking them, as we similarly did with the City Council of Venezia, to allow us to organize an exhibition inside of the spaces of this house, a temporary exhibition, just before the uh, demolition of the house occurred, because they were planning to demolish the house in order to realize this famous luxury glamping. In order to do that, we once more uh, produce a contract with them that they allow us one week of uh, residency uh, at the condition that we don't oh. show any image of the outcome of the residency before the house is demolished because they were, they were of course, um, somehow worried that this uh, superintendenza of Venezia would stop the, the, the works for the demolition of the, of the house. And which actually happened according to the story in September 2020. And so this is how the story goes. The house was almost going to be demolished. We do an exhibition there, then the house is demolished. We can finally show the outcomes of the exhibition. Now, after the story and the character and the place was decided, we needed to find a protocol. And the protocol for the exhibition was pretty simple. We went back to see this fantastic drawing by John Iduk. You, saw, you see that there's 12 rooms, each one with a number and a specific furniture, as I said. Therefore, we gave 12 authors randomly, which we chose these 12 authors among uh, international architects who deal in a very interesting way with uh, fiction and storytelling and narratives. We give them randomly one of the rooms with the assignment of imagining that they would spend one week of residency locked inside of this house on this island, and they would have to produce and transform to produce this piece of furniture which corresponds to the furniture uh, imagined by Hajduk uh, related to the room, the room that was given to them, and also transformed the interior space of the room as part of the residency. And we would show, as in the exhibition, the outcome of this one week of residency. 
Of course, when you do a residency inside of a fictional building, you need to have a building or to design a building. And with IDUC, that's not so easy because there were several different versions of the same house, like this one, which is different from this one. We chose this one, this version here. I'm not gonna explain uh, why, because otherwise it will take too long. We digitalize this version of John Iduk's house and this digital drawing on CAD becomes the base of the whole exhibition that, that everything gravitates around. Basically, we needed to produce two houses because we decided we would have a digital exhibition in December when the, uh, everything was still closed, we were in lockdown, in a physical exhibit in December of last year, 2020, in a physical exhibition during the opening of the uh, Biennale in May 2021. For the digital exhibition, we had the house of uh, the replica redrawn. So this is a replica of a replica, we could say, by Giovanni Benedetti, and placed again into an imaginary analog island of Tessera with some Aldo Rossi architecture in the background, if you maybe uh, spot it. To do an exhibition in this house is pretty simple. We simply gave each one, of, just like in the Hajduk's uh, drawing, each one of the uh, architects the space of one window, actually 724 pixels by 1080 pixels, and they had this space to produce an animated GIF and the video, precisely with these proportions, and carte blanche. They could do whatever they wanted. With the physical exhibition, of course, it was a little bit more tricky. And we decided to work with a 1 to 16 scale model, which would be made of, of course, like the main uh, body of the building, but the 12 rooms would be possible to extract and send by email to the 12 contributors, uh, uh, all this mailing and boxing with Amazon that we were used to also in the period of the lockdown. So they would receive the box, they would modify the box, uh, so do actually their intervention and send it back to us so that we could recompose this cadaver esquisse. And of course, it, this idea came also thinking at this famous image of the hand uh, putting one of the rooms, uh, one of the apartments of the unit habitation inside of this infrastructure. With the only difference, we will take out a room instead of putting the room in. This is a picture of the model uh, with the, the two different parts being uh, realized by Errante Architetture. This was uh, autumn of last year. This is uh, the rooms being packed for expedition and this is the day in which the rooms were uh, spread, sent, mailed uh, all around Europe and also on the other side of the continent, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. Then after the protocol was finished, the place uh, and so on, we needed to start with a campaign of, as we said, we wanted to make the story believable. So of course we communicated on our own social media that we had found this island with an abandoned building, a replica by, building by Hajduk uh, and so on and so forth. But we also published uh, several articles like in a Spanish magazine, in a Romanian magazine, and also on Domus web, where we told the said, uh, the incredible and sad tale of the lonely Contessa and her wall house. Quite interestingly, beside many people asking us whether the story was true or not, uh, and, and always being ambiguous about it, one of the curious effects that this fiction produces is that we, get, we got contacted by Renata Hajduk, the daughter of John Hajduk and responsible for the John Hajduk Fund. And we had a very interesting conversation a few days before the opening of the physical exhibition in May, since at a certain moment she wrote us, I just realized that apparently that you found a, a replica of a building by my father I didn't know anything about. How is that even possible? <laughs> and uh, she was kind of like um, astonished by the whole story. So we explained to them what we were really working on. They understood after a long one hour discussion that we were really working along the lines uh, of John Iduk's uh, method. So in the end, they appreciated what we did and they were okay with the fact that we were, let's say, using the, the name of John Iduk, even if, uh, as a matter of fact, all the material we were producing and showing was not coming from their archive or, uh, or, um, or funds, but it was coming actually from, or it was original stuff produced by us. Then the two exhibitions, I'm, I'm almost there, guys. Uh, as said, we wanted to organize a digital exhibition in December last year and a physical exhibition in uh, Venezia in May this year. The digital exhibition is kind of uh, difficult to explain, if not by uh, quickly navigating through it, and I will do so uh, for you now. I hope you can see it. Uh, this would be the homepage. I mean, it was an ex also an experiment of what does it mean to make a digital exhibition, something that we are very interested in at this at the moment. So this will be the splash page where you see this uh, text on, uh, on the lower part of the screen asking you for the full experience of the exhibition to grant access to the webcam and to switch to full screen mode. Therefore, giving access to the webcam and switch it on full screen mode. And I think that now you won't see my face reflected 
in the um, in the screen simply because the zoom uh, software is using the camera so now the site is not working 100 but you would see my face also or the face of anyone who's looking at the website in that very moment uh, reflected as we try to reconstruct this surreal experience of looking at the house of the inhabitant who refused to participate from the tower, therefore seeing your face reflected in the glass. It's a pity that in, in Zoom, this is not possible to replicate, but you can go to richardsofsolitude.com and have the experience of the website yourself. Simply put, of course, you enter the house in front of the house, you are in the island of Tessera, you see the interventions of the 12 contributors. There is, of course, a menu that explains to you what, what happened. And then quite simply, again, just like in a website with several windows, you can enter each one of these uh, rooms, such as, for example, the one that shows the intervention by Aristide Antonas, who had as a topic uh, the bathtub. So this would be the bathtub that Aristide Antonas designed for uh, his own contribution uh, in the digital exhibition of the unfolding pavilion. Or another one, for example, the one about the shower. This is Mayo's contribution where they took all videos that in TikTok or Instagram have the hashtag shower to show, actually show uh, what is the, uh, let's say, how the word shower is being used or what kind of uh, um, uh, production can the word shower today uh, enact uh, on uh, social media. Or again, uh, we could see briefly this uh, video by Falatelier, which would show the refrigerator room, uh, which ends, uh, starts very analogical and ends with these digital cats, uh, which remind us of the kind of surreal digital space in which we all live right now. One thing that for us was very important is that the uh, visitor of the website have no control on the videos. Usually when you see a video online, you would be able to stop it and go back and go forward and so on. This doesn't happen in this uh, project. Just like in any gallery, you see a video from the beginning to the end, or if you want to see it until the end, you have to wait for the end. You have no control. And this constraint also reminded us of, of course, the kind of constraints we were living in the domestic space at that very moment. Uh, we uh, suggest you visit uh, yourself the, the website. There's a lot of uh, nice things, but I will go on, not to be too long, to simply conclude with the, some material from the physical exhibition, which we organized in May. As already said, uh, you know, we sent the boxes uh, to the authors, the boxes came back. In the meantime, we had the, the building of IDUC being realized uh, by Errant Architectura. Uh, two things were important, of course. As always, uh, we wanted to find a special location for the exhibition, and we chose this trabaccolo, the famous trabaccolo of the Contessa, which is this mercantile boat, which is moored uh, in Punta della Dogana, which is arguably one of the most beautiful spots in all of Venice. So we secured this space. Uh, actually, the belly of the boat became the space that we opened up to the public for the first time. Again, uh, um, let's say ordering this mess that we found when we entered them into the boat. And the second, uh, and of course, there's one important thing to say. Uh, we had a specific, for the first time, a specific uh, uh, exhibition design made for this space, which because it was so special that, and the floor was so uneven that it was impossible to uh, drop anything on the floor. So uh, Errata Architectura made this project that actually holds um, on the, uh, and make, makes the whole exhibition fly, which was the only way we could actually work in a, uh, let's say, uh, efficient way with the very strange space which we were giving, also because it, it floats, so everything dropped would actually fall or roll at a certain moment. And the second important thing for us would be that the exhibition would be would fit inside of a car. This is not only for uh, cheapness, so we wouldn't have to rent any uh, big truck to, to move it, but also because we want the exhibition for the first time to be a traveling exhibition. One of the main problems of the Enfoldi Pavilion is that it lasts only for those few days of the vernissage. For the first time, we have an exhibition that we will make travel, and we are already arranging a couple of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, places where to make the exhibition moves in the next uh, months. So all the material which has been mobilized is not wasted, but it's going to be used and used and used, we hope, at least in the near future. And also, of course, not only should fit in a car, but also on the boat of a friend who always takes us to the place where we install our exhibitions in Venezia, and it perfectly fitted in his small boat as well. So this will be just some images from the exhibition. You see already from the other side of the Grand Canal, the boat with our pirate flag, uh, with the logo of the unfolding pavilion, uh, showing that something is happening. 
uh, then you will get closer to the boat uh, and to the point that the boat starts to uh, interact with the space of Punta della Dogana is a sort of hetero heterotopia, is a sort of world that you have to enter and then that you, you can exit to go back to the world of Venezia. Uh, on top of the boat, basically, once you're in, uh, the space will be divided in two vertical layers, uh, one on top of the other. The upper, uh, lay the upper deck will be a place for uh, communication, for drinking, for joining people that you don't, haven't seen for a while, especially for drinking, I have to say. And then in the, inside of the belly of the boat, you would experience the exhibition totally alone. This was not only for uh, security issues and health issues, of course, but it was also because the, the main theme, as I already said, of the exhibition was precisely solitude. So the idea was that the exhibition space should be experienced in complete solitude. This is what you would find once you would go down the belly of the boat. You see this hanging exhibition device with the cadaver skis, reconstructed cadaver skis, uh, maquette of the replica of John Hyduk's house. And you can see also on the floor, as I said, this floor was very uneven, but actually quite interestingly, which is not so clear to see in this picture, there was water running through the beams. So it was a very strange space, uh, smelling like petrol with water running and shaking. You have to imagine that the painting was constantly uh, banging on top of the wall it was uh, nailed to, because this was, was one actually the, the crazy, craziest exhibition space that we ever organized an exhibition in. And we, of course, understand why not so many people do organize exhibitions inside of boats for all the problems which go attached with them. A close-up uh, image of the, um, of the, of the model, uh, even closer, so you can appreciate all the different contributions. They were not simply replicas of the digital contributions. They were actually some of them contributions in themselves, which complemented the digital exhibition. So the two exhibitions coexist and are complementary. They don't substitute one uh, the other. Also very important for us was this rear view mirror, which would allow the side of the house. And the reason is that um, the, the back side of the house of John Iduk had never been designed in 3D and never been realized in 3D. The only 3D representation of the project was this diorama by Hajduk, which doesn't show the back. So we were, let's say, the first ones to actually build the back of the house uh, of the inhabitant who refused to participate and to proudly show it uh, as part of the exhibition. Then the exhibition, of course, also showed the video loop that was produced uh, for uh, the different contributions in a loop that were produced for the digital exhibition, an episode uh, on an old TV of the Hollywood Squares, uh, which was the great inspiration of, <laughs> of the project, uh, according to our narrative, at least. And then uh, one more uh, replica of the replica of the replica of the house uh, of the inhabitant who refused to participate, uh, uh, framed with an old um, wooden frame. This will be a picture of the vernissage. Uh, a lot of people came. We were like uh, more than 60 or 70 people at the same time on, on the boat, which was meant to gather, uh, let's say 40 uh, people, <laughs> probably. It was very successful also given the fact that, that, that there was not so much going on in Venezia. And this will be a picture of the night of the exhibition, which is just before we started to dismantle the exhibition. And this is important for us to say, the exhibition only lasted one day. And for two main reasons. First of all, because we wanted to radicalize this concept that there is always a concept of the unfolding pavilion. The first edition was five days, the second three, and the last one was one day only exhibition. So what happens when you basically transform an exhibition into a performance somehow was a, a matter of exploration. But also it was kind of a critique to the whole Biennale opening without considering uh, the strange situation in which we were at the moment. Some pavilions didn't manage to open, some pavilions opened without being finished, no vernissages, no open um, events happened. Actually, I think we were one of the very few public events uh, happening in the whole vernissage of the Biennale. And so to reduce to only one day the, the exhibition to us made sense in this way. But also there will be also, of course, the problem. So how do you do it? Why do you mobilize so much material if it's only for one day? Well, as usual, we have all the documentation, which like in all exhibitions is made to allow the exhibition to become permanent. Exhibitions are permanent as far as they are documented. And this time, and this is the last slide, we are even working more radically on this documentation. So beside the usual pictures uh, and texts uh, and videos and so on. We did digitalize the whole space of the exhibition inside and outside. So both the boat and the interior of the boat. So we are actually building a 3D model of the uh, exhibition space that will be soon, hopefully uh, by the end of the summer, uh, uploaded online in order to allow everyone who couldn't go to Venezia 
in those days, and it was really the vast majority of architects, if compared to the norm, to experience uh, our third and fourth pavilion. Thank you very much, and sorry if we were a little bit longer than uh, than asked by by Peter. I think if you if you'd gone on for another hour, we would have all been very happy to have you. <laughs> and that was absolutely extraordinary. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.